Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Friday Ramblings, and it's time to continue our little tripsy trapsy trail through the world of media industries, self-censorships. Now we've covered the movie industry pretty thoroughly, discussing both the original Hayes Code, which flat out decided what Hollywood movies could not do, and the modern MPAA, which is more about informing people about what the movies do have going on so they can make their own informed decisions. Today we're going to tackle the world of video games. And that means, yes, it is time to talk about the ESRB. Yep, our old buddies and friends at the ESRB. First though, we had to get in a little bit of history. Now, the idea of video games with objectionable, controversial content uh, goes back to 1976 with the arcade game Death Race, which required the users to run over so-called gremlins and avoid the gravestones left behind. Although back then, as with it being 1976, the graphics really didn't get too gruesome and detailed. It did have sound effects and the overall theme of vehicular homicide, even if it was not of human beings, did cause some people to feel that it was not a game that had a lot of taste and charm to it. Of course, more famous would be the various um, sexually explicit games put out on the Atari 2600, the crowning king of them all being Custer's Revenge, a game where the alleged General Custer forces himself upon a Native American woman over and over again as he tries to avoid the arrows of the off-screen Native American men who wish him not to non-consensually interact with their female. Yes, that is the entire purpose of the game. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Don't expect to see that one on the remake pile anytime soon, folks. However, the subsequent 1983 industry crash, along with most of the industry being brought back, especially in the home console market, through the Nintendo company and their Nintendo Entertainment System, where the company itself chose to uh, regulate what kind of content could be on their system, brought some of the problems down a peg, brought things down to a whisper. Now, that's not to say there weren't still adult games coming out, but they were pretty much regulated to the uh, PC market, which in the 80s and early 90s was not really a big thing. And for stores that thought this was pointless, it was as easy as them choosing not to stock the games because it was such a tiny little niche market. Um, in fact, a representative of the Software Publishers Association was quoted as saying that adult computer software was nothing to worry about and it's not an issue the government wants to spend any time with. Um, the association did recommend voluntary warnings for games that did feature adult content like the famous Leisure Suit Larry series. However, everything came up full circle and we got into some Hayes Code style <laughs> government rulings in the early 90s. Senator Joe Lieberman and Herb Cole led hearings on video game violence and its link potential links to corruption of society. The two biggest games cited in this hearings of the video game industry basically being out of control was the then highly recent and highly popular Mortal Kombat. Yep, the original Mortal Kombat 
Before sequels, before reboots, before movie adaptations. It was a game that made it all the way to the Senate for its infamous amounts of blood and detailed fatality kills. Along with, on the other side of the coin, when it comes to objectionable content, Night Trap. A FMV-based game which featured 90 minutes of scenes considered to be sexually suggestive and exploitative. Uh, for the record, I have seen at least some of these scenes because you can find Let's Plays of Night Trap online. By modern standards, they would be considered extremely soft core. And in fact, at the time, late night cable networks would often show movies that showed eh, just as much, if not worse, content when it came to sexual objectification. But again, this was at a time period where there really was not a concept like video games for adults and not meant for children. At this point in time, there was still very much the belief of the entire um, non-video game playing community that only little kids played video games and therefore super violence and sexuality meant that the game industry was corrupting our youth. What's gonna happen? Well, video game industries had to do something to prevent the federal government from setting out their own regulation board because much like the movie industry, they were afraid that they would appoint people who had no concept of video games and would put in motion things that would hurt business by using outdated, antiquated, ultra-conservative measures. Now again, this was the worst case scenario. This was not something being directly threatened at the time, but that is what spurred companies on. Uh, Sega had previously implemented its own voluntary rating systems, the Video Game Rating Council. However, that was only effective on Sega's own consoles. It did not affect anything put out on the Nintendo or any consoles put out by companies that were not one of the big two. Such as the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer put out by the 3DO company and various other things. Uh, TurboGrafx um, line of consoles etc etc and the aforementioned 3DO system entertainment system had its own age ratings voluntarily determined by game, game publishers and the recreational software advisory council which was primarily formed for rating PC games which used a system that rated intensity of specific classes of objectionable content but did not use the age recommendations that people already found familiar and easy to understand that the MPAA had helped pioneer. Senator Joe Lieberman did not feel any of those systems were sufficient and by February of 1994 was threatening to propose the creation of the Federal Commission to regulate and rate video games. And major chains like Toys R Us were claiming they would not stock any games that they personally found too intense for children, thus basically guaranteeing huge sales for those who, you know, were okay with playing this kind of stuff as informed consumers wouldn't have the ability to buy the games. Time to step things up. Thus... A major group, group of video game developers and publishers, including Acclaim, Electronic Arts, Nintendo, and Sega, 
formed a political trade group known as the Interactive Digital Software Association with the goal to create a separate regulatory framework for assessing and rating all the video games that they were associated with. Ultimately, a vendor neutral rating system known as the Entertainment Software Rating Board, the ESRB, see now we're up to the birth of it, was developed as this would ensure that nobody would be slighted by feeling like they were being forced to use their competitors' um, existing rules and regulations. And more importantly, it could show the federal government that they were taking this seriously by building a system from scratch, thus they could claim they were directly addressing the concerns of the senators who, who wanted to form the Federal Regulatory Commission, not simply saying, oh yeah, we'll just take this system that's already around that you didn't find impressive and apply it to everything else. Smart moves, smart moves all around. So we have the ESRB. Great. Now, the formation of the ERSB was officially announced to Congress on July 29th, 1994, and officially launched on September 16th. Its initial system consisted of five age-based ratings. Early childhood, kids to adults, which in 1998 was later renamed to everyone, teen, mature, and adults only. They also used descriptors with brief explanations of the content contained in the game, to help parents better decide if this was content they want their children exposed to. It's one thing to say, hey, we think this stuff should only be played by teens. It's another thing to say, look, we think this stuff should only be played by teens because it shows graphic, realistic violence, or it shows drug and alcohol use, or hey, there's sexual content equivalent to a rated R movie in here. See? Good thinking. Good thinking. They're taking stuff that, once again, the MPAA had already pioneered and laid out and brought it forward, adapted it to their own industry, which is wonderful. Now, the U.S. arcade gaming industry did not adopt the ESRB system. The American Amusement Machine Association citing fundamental differences between the coin-operated and consumer segments of the video game industry, claimed that they would adopt their own three-tier parental advisory system using three color-coded levels of intensity, green, yellow, and red, affixing stickers of that color to arcade cabinet artwork. But we are going to focus primarily on the ESRB. Now again, it should also be noted these ratings only apply to material distributed here in America. Other countries have adopted their own rating systems. They can choose to not use the ESRB ratings if they want, going with their own. Now, eventually as the rise of mobile gaming through smartphones and tablets has come about, we have seen a subdivision known as the Entertainment Software Rating Board Interactive, which rates internet content as well as um, whether it be games or general purpose media. This was discontinued in 2003 Um, no, excuse me, yeah, the current smartphone use is done uh, doop -a -doop, as a partnership between the ESRB and the CTIA, which is a group of major U.S. companies representing the wireless industry, um, creating a free voluntary ratings process for mobile app stores. The system uses the ESRB's icons and content descriptors along with four additional interactive elements, Digital purposes, shares info, shares locations, and users interact to let people know about apps' behavior in regards to data collection and interaction with others. Now, where do we ultimately get down to this? Well, the modern ESRB rating system is 
a little more tiered and complicated than what was originally proposed, which is good. Things should evolve and change over time. Let's break this down real quick. You will have rating pending, which is a symbol used for promotional materials for games which have not yet been assigned a final rating by the ESRB. Rating pending likely mature 17 plus, which is for games that once again have not gotten their final rating, but the publishing studio has given enough information to feel that it is going to get a high rating and, the, and makes it a little easier to let people know ahead of time. Eh, probably not best to even think about letting your eight-year-old play this. We have the E for Everyone. Originally known as KA for Kids to Adults. This is content that the ESRB believes is suitable for all ages, including minimal cartoon fantasy, violence, and or the infrequent use of mild language. E10+, plus, which is of course everyone 10 and over. This is content the ESR ESRB believes is suitable for ages 10 and over which includes slightly more cartoon fantasy violence, slightly more mild language, and introduces the idea of minimal suggestive things. Our buddies come around with puberty, we get the teen rating, which means the SRB feels that it is only suitable for ages 13 and over, including the introduction of somewhat more realistic violence, much more regular use of suggestive themes, crude humor, aka off-color, toilet humor, minimal blood, and or infrequent use of strong language, aka profanity. Then we have mature. Games with ratings contain content that usually believes is suitable for ages 17 and over, including intense realistic violence, blood and gore, sexual content, strong language, drug use, nudity, and or crude humor. Piling up to AO, which is adults only games. These are games that have prolonged scenes of intense violence and or graphic sexual content. This is the rarest rating to find because well, frankly put, if you are producing games that have that level of violence and or sexual content, and most of the games that do get AOA are getting it for sexual content, you are catering to a very small niche audience. Again, not judging you particular. If you want to play those games, if you want to produce those games, that's fine. Just saying, your major industry uh, developers and publishers will do everything they can to avoid an AO rating similar to the Motion Picture Association not wanting an NC-17 rating if they can avoid it. Previously from 1994 to 2018 there was an early childhood rating which meant it was content aimed towards a preschool audience. However due to its lack of use over time it was retired Thus, any games that would have gotten the EC rating are tend to be grouped under that E for Everyone rating. Now, of course, besides the main letters, you do have, as we said before, your various content descriptors. Short little tags that clue a consumer into exactly why it got the rating it did. Real quick, we're going to go through these as well because, hey, that's what it's all about. You have alcohol reference, animated blood, blood, blood and gore, cartoon violence, comic mischief, crude humor, drug reference, edutainment, fantasy violence, informational, intense violence, language, uh, potentially objectionable lyrics, mature humor, mild violence, nudity, partial nudity, Real gambling, i.e. players can gamble with real life currency. Sexual content, sexual themes, sexual violence. Simulated gambling. 
Some adult assistance may be needed, used for younger age gain audiences. Strong language, strong lyrics, strong sexual content, suggestive themes, tobacco reference, use of drugs, use of alcohol, use of tobacco, and violence. Now, I know a lot of these seem uh, kind of redundant, but you do have to remember is it's a matter of degrees. As I said before, there is simple cartoon violence. This would be your classic Looney Tunes stuff. And there is your super realistic Mortal Kombat violence. You do want to designate between the two because that can be the difference between an E and a T rating or even an M rating. As we said before, the interactive um, element games it's usually find in app stores includes in-game purchases which means that you are using real world money to purchase virtual items shares info shares location users interact which means players can get in direct communication with others through the app unrestricted internet use and of course the similar trading pendings online interactions not rated by the ESRB this is usually used in games where there is a regular releasing of user-generated online content independent of the rated content of the game itself. This notice was formally worded as game experience may change during online play. So, what does the ESRB actually do for enforcement? Because what's the point of having a system if it can't be enforced? Well. The SRB rating system is primarily enforced on a self-regulatory basis by the video game and retail industries. In markets where it's used, retailers typically enforce the mature rating using photo identification or have refused to stock video games having ratings that are higher than they feel like their particular consumer base is comfortable with. Often refusing to stock video games that have not been rated by the organization at all as a way to encourage publishers and developers to work along with the ESRB. Modern video game consoles can also include parental controls that can be configured to restrict games played by specific users using factors such as their ESRB rating. The ESRB rating boards has also taken action against video game distributors who use the rating icons in advertising without authorization or having actually been issued the rating by the board. Online digital distribution storefront Steam, which is used by personal computers, does display ratings when available and allows games to be categorized and filtered based on their own internal categories and the extent of potentially objectionable content. However, they do not feel the ESRB rating is mandatory for their products. Steam itself would, in June of 2018, following complaints regarding inconsistent enforcement, state it would only ban the sale of games that contain blatantly illegal content or games that it classifies as being, quote, straight up trolling. However, in March of 2019, it was revealed there are still undisclosed limitations to this policy based on, quote, costs and risks associated with Steam's ability to distribute specific games because, hey, there's always a loophole somewhere if you dig deep enough. In the United States, various people have attempted at different levels of government to introduce laws requiring retailers to enforce the ESRB rating system. In California, a bill was uh, sponsored requiring retailers to stock M-rated games on separate shelves that are at least five feet from the ground. The bill was passed after it was modified and only required that retailers promote awareness of the SRB rating systems to their customer, not having the whole modified shelf thing. However, a second year was sponsored, or a second bill was sponsored the following year, banning the sale of quote violent video games to minors. The term was defended using a variation of the Miller test, originally created to judge whether work is obscene, separate from any rating the game may have received from the ESRB. A landmark ruling the law was struck down by the Supreme Court in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, which ruled that the 
bill would be considered unconstitutional because video games are a protected form of expression, aka video games fall under freedom of the media, an amendment commonly known as freedom of the press. In Canada, ESRB ratings are enforced under provisional laws by film rating boards, as in the U.S., most retailers voluntarily enforce the ratings regardless. Now, has there been occasions where developers and publishers have wanted to argue their e the game's ESRB ratings, especially because it might mean, for instance, in case of a game getting mature rating when they needed a teen rating, as the mature ratings tend to hurt sales? Yeah, it happens. But what it comes down to is, is the ESRB doing its job? Yes. It's keeping the federal government from dictating what video games can be created, allowing the free expression of creative people to flourish, but also showing that, frankly, and I'm going to get a little bit of a soapbox here, look, you can be a creator, you can be an artist, you can have your freedom to make whatever you want, but understand you have a responsibility to make sure the public is informed properly about what you are creating so they can make a informed, appropriate, responsible decision whether to expose themselves to your content. Thus, hey, it's not your fault. If you create a video game and it gets a teen rating for very fair reasons and you put that teen rating on and you know your video game and you put those content descriptors on there saying, hey, language, hey, violence of this level, intensity, and somebody play, and somebody buys that game for their five-year-old, it's not your fault as the artist if they then turn around and are upset that their five-year-old was exposed to that content. Why did you give it to your five-year-old? It was a teen-rated game. That's on the consumer. As I said before, everybody's free to create whatever kind of games you want. But you do have to take some acknowledgement that, you know what, especially with video games which do have that interactive element, you have to make sure people know what's in the game before they play it. That way, when you make a game and you're picturing, you know, a 22-year-old playing your intense game about being a hardened criminal who swears and drinks and does biblically inappropriate things with women of loose morals, yeah, you program that picture in a... 20, you know, somebody in their 20s who understands these concepts playing your game. So why would you want somebody half that age playing it? Just saying. The base idea helps everybody. We just got to make sure as consumers that we take the ESRB seriously, just like we do movie ratings, and that the publishers and creators appreciate what the ERSB does to protect them so that everybody can be happy. Personally, I do play games that are rated M for Mature. Sometimes I'm in that mood. I do play games that are rated teen. I play games that are rated E10. I even play games that are rated E. So, as an adult, who plays video games, I play whatever I want. Sometimes I'm in the mood for one kind of game, sometimes I'm in the mood for another. But I'm going to tell you this, anytime a game comes out, whether I'm just looking at it on the shelf because I say hey, that particular game slipped by me, I don't know about that game, or it's one I'm already highly interested in, I'll be honest, somebody that knows about the ESRB and what it's for, 
I do look for that little letter, that T, that E, that M, that E with 10, because that can also help me immediately get a sense of what the game's going to contain. Before I even turn around and look at the back and look at the screenshots and the detailed description of the plot, I've already got an inkling of what I'm diving into. And that's a good thing. Still, we're not quite done yet. We got one more media industry that has had some problems with the feds wanting to censor. And they had to do some self-regulating. And it still stands to this day, though not necessarily in the form it used to. Ooh. What do we got? Well, you're going to have to wait until next time for that one. But in the meantime and in between time, I appreciate you watching today and hope to stay happy, healthy, and I'll see you in seven next time we ramble. Bye-bye, folks.